Hey, what's going on, everybody? So for today's episode, I wanted to share something that I came across in John chapter 7 as I'm reading through the book of John right now. And it's a it's a verse in John chapter 7 that I've probably read a dozen times, if not more. But for the first time, it really struck me in a way <clears throat> that it never has before. And it's got a message that is very salient for such a time as this, dare I say. So in John chapter 5, a little bit of context, is when Jesus heals the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. So he heals this lame man at the pool of Bethesda, and then it's on the Sabbath. He heals him, tells him, pick up your pallet and go home. And then some Pharisees, some Jewish religious leaders come across this man, and they say, what are you doing carrying your pallet on the Sabbath? And the guy was basically like, look, I just got healed by Jesus. He said, he healed me. He said, pick up your pallet and go home. And then in John chapter 6 is the passage where Jesus famously says that, where is it? Uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves, which causes a lot of people who were following him and who were his disciples at the time to leave him. And that's also the very famous place where Jesus says to Peter and to the 12 disciples, you're going to leave me too. And uh, Peter says to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So that's what uh, Peter says in John chapter 6. And then in John chapter 7, Jesus goes up to the Feast of Booths, and he's again confronted by some of the Jewish leaders and others who are in a crowd. And so that, that's sort of the context of where I'm going to pick it up in John chapter 7, starting at verse 19, is the Jewish leaders and Jesus tussling again. So Jesus says to them, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. And the deed he's talking about is the healing of that lame man. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. It's that last verse there, verse 24 of John chapter 7. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So here's Jesus talking to his Pharisees, and he's saying, Look, who cares what it looks like? You all, in order to fulfill the law of Moses, you circumcise your children. If you have a boy who on his eighth day, if that eighth day lands on the Sabbath, you circumcise him, even though it's on the Sabbath, because you want to fulfill the law of Moses. And then you turn around, and again, Jesus talking to his Pharisees, you turn around, you give me a hard time, and I made an entire man whole on the Sabbath. I healed a whole human being of this lifelong infirmity, or however long he had it, and you give me a hard time. Stop looking at appearances. Oh, you th it's, it's a bad look? You think it's a bad look that I healed a guy on the Sabbath? I healed a man. I did the righteous thing, just like it's righteous for you to circumcise on the Sabbath, even though it may be a bad look, I did the right thing by healing this guy on the Sabbath. So again, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. I mean, how often do we hear that, including from the cultural elite, particularly within Big Eva, within Christianity, the Christian elite? It's all about the visuals. It's all about optics. We got to care about what we look like to the world rather than the focus being on righteousness. So a handful of examples that I, I thought of. So like, for instance, just the very benign, basic calling of homosexuals sinners. Homosexuals are sinners because homosexuality is a sin. It is an abominable sexual sin. Just doing that it can, can be considered bad optics. I think of you know, J.D. Greer, the whole, his whole thing about, you know, God whispers about sexual sin. God does, who, God, first of all, God does not whisper about sexual sin, but his point there is, look, or one of, one of the takeaways from that could be that, look, you don't want to, we don't want to be a bad witness to the world. We need to be, we need to be shouting about the things that really matter. While in the meantime, we need, we need to be soft peddling these things that might get us in trouble with the culture and might get us in trouble with the world. What are we more worried about? Are we worried about the world and the culture not liking us because we call sodomites sodomites and we call homosexuality the sin that it is? Or are we more concerned with righteousness? Are we more concerned with the fact that homosexuals are caught up in a sexual lifestyle that is leading them on a literal pathway to hell and that they need to repent and come to Christ? And repenting and come to, coming to Christ means wholesale rejection of their entire homosexual identity. Speaking of identity, it's considered by many of the intelligentsia within Big Eva 
to not call trannies trannies and to offer hospitality to this destructive ideology, this ideology that is literally mutilating the genitalia of young boys and of young girls, that is providing irreversible damage to young boys and young girls, that is stopping them from going through puberty, making them eunuchs and infertile, unable to have children, and causing damage to their bodies that cannot be easily undone if undone at all. And meanwhile, you have people within like the Gospel Coalition and other institutions and outlets who talk about pronoun hospitality and things like that. Well, look, if it, if they identify, if it's a man that identifies as a woman, just use, you know, she, her pronouns. And you got people all over putting their pronouns in their Twitter profile, things like that. They're more interested in appeasing man and pleasing man than they are in pleasing God. They're more interested in appearances than in righteous judgment, than in calling transgenderism a sin against a holy God who made them male and female. That's it. Gender is binary. Sex is binary. There are no other choices that are destroying the physical and the spiritual lives, destroying the souls of human beings, in particular young people. It doesn't matter if that's a bad appearance, if it may get you canceled, if it may get you called a bigot. The truth is the truth, and righteousness is righteousness, and it doesn't matter because, again, to quote Jesus, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Same thing with, uh, what, what was one? Well, patriarchy. Patriarchy is another one. So if you espouse patriarchy and male headship and male headship in not just the home, but also in the church like the scriptures call for, and that there is a distinct nature for men and it's distinct nature for women. Women are the weaker vessels. Men are bigger, stronger, faster generally. They're meant and created for certain things. Women are meant and created for certain things. They're meant for birthing children, for nurturing those children when they come out of the womb. We have specific admonitions to men and specific admonitions, exhortations, and instructions to women in the scriptures as well. And so if you espouse biblical patriarchy like you should, because the Bible espouses patriarchy, then that may be a bad look. You may get called a misogynist. Who cares if you get called a misogynist? What is right? What is the righteous call of God? The righteous call of God is for male eldership in the church and for male headship in the household as well. And then there's, uh, this is one that comes up every so often, at least that I've noticed. I don't know if other of you have noticed it, but so Doug Wilson, what he's doing up in Moscow, he basically gets accused of nepotism and favoring those who are close to him. So he has hired his son, both of his daughters and other family members of his to be involved in what he has going on up in Moscow. So it's not just him, but he's sort of the man behind what goes on up there, whether it's Logos School, ACCS, New St. Andrews, Canon Press, he gets accused of, oh, well, he's just bringing in his buddies and his family members. Again, that's biblical. That's righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And it's not as if he's bringing in inept individuals or the leadership there in Moscow with the various institutions that they run are bringing in inept leaders and inept people to operate and work within their institutions. They're bringing in righteous individuals who have proven themselves capable Nate Wilson is a brilliant writer and film director. He should have the roles within the greater Moscow empire, the Wilson empire that he has. Same thing with both of Doug's daughters and his brother Gordon and what he contributes to the biology and the science side of things. I think a lot of the people just deep down are perhaps jealous or envious and wish that they had an inheritance to leave to their friends and to their family members and to their progeny. I mean, if anything, we should be shooting for this. This should be what every single one of us wants to do, leave this kind of a legacy for our children and our children's children, because that's what's righteous. So who cares if it looks bad, if it looks like nepotism? I say then more nepotism because that kind of nepotism is actually scriptural. It's righteous regardless of how it looks. And then um, li just in general, general liberal uh, compromises um, within Big Eva, if you call out those liberal compromises, then you're, you know, you're not showing kindness. You're not being compassionate. You're, you're being, you're being mean. You're breaking the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice. 
Um, why aren't you rebuking them in private? Well, because they're making public proclamations. You're not being loving. You're not loving your neighbor. You're being a bad witness for Christianity. No, the reverse is actually true. People like the Kellers, the Karen Swallow Priors, the ERLCs, Russell Moore's Gospel Coalition, they're the ones who are propagating scriptural untruths. And it doesn't matter if it's a bad look to the big Eva intelligentsia or to certain people in the world that this is a bad look. What matters is what is righteous. What matters is judging with a righteous judgment. So when Tim Keller puts out another tweet blasting the church blasting the bride of Christ for unsubstantiated claims that he makes, then we should be rejecting that and pushing back against it. When he promotes socialism, we should be pu pushing back. When, when he promotes his third wayism, we should be pro um, pushing back on that. The appearances, again, the appearances aren't what matters. What matters are the righteous, is the righteous judgment uh, taking place. So it makes me think of something that Jonathan Lehman said a couple of years ago now his whole cultural capital comment. So he was talking with, I think, the cross-politic guys about, I think it was, and this was within the context of opening up the church during COVID. And this was, I think, in the summer of 2020, after MacArthur had opened up his church, when it was still, I mean, there's still a stigma of opening up your church now, but not nearly like there was uh, two summers ago. The stigma was huge, a lot of pressure on, from, from Christians as well, on Christian churches actually opening back up and doing what you know, the scriptures and the Lord have commanded them to do, which is to meet on the Lord's day and to not forsake the gathering of the saints. So he talked about cultural capital and wanting to save our cultural capital as Christians and to use our cultural capital in situations that, I don't know, would be more gospel centered or relevant or whatever the case may be. If you're not willing to use whatever alleged cultural capital that you've accumulated for going to church, then you're never going to use it. Or you don't understand what it means to use whatever cultural capital and good graces you have for the culture. But, it, but that's besides the point. Who cares what the culture says? What's the righteous judgment? The righteous judgment is you meet on the Lord's Day. Christians gather. Christians go to church. Church isn't on Zoom. Church isn't virtual. Christians meet together and they gather as the body of Christ. Was it a bad look to the world and to even many within Christianity, including the intelligentsia and Big Eva? Yeah, it was. Who cares? Who cares what the appearances are? Who cares if it makes you look mean to call homosexual sinners, to call tranny ideology scumbag and demonic? Who cares if it makes you look misogynistic to espouse biblical patriarchy and male eldership in the church? It doesn't matter what the appearances are. It matters what's right and what's righteous and what's just according to a just judgment and a just standard that is found in the scriptures, not found in whether or not human beings approve of what you do as a follower of God. We're not here to please man, ultimately. We're here to please God and do things according to his scriptures and his standards. All right, well, I think that's all I got. Uh, for now, I just had that uh, pop into my head. I hope that was helpful. God bless.